Okay, choice A. So 488, question number nine. In order to reduce the number of items damaged while in transit to customers, packaging consultants recommended that the TrueSave mail order company increase the amount of packaging, packing material so as to fill any empty spaces in its cartons. Accordingly, TrueSave officials instructed the company's packers to use more packing material than before, and the packers zealously acted on these instructions and used as much as they could. Nevertheless, customer reports of damaged items rose somewhat. Which of the following, if true, helps to explain why acting on the consultant's recommendation failed to achieve its goal? So, again, to summarize the argument, um, they wanted to um, reduce the amount of damage. The recommendation was put more uh, packing material in, and the, they did so, and the amount of damage went up. So, clearly, there is a correlation, at least, between the way that they put in, between you know what they did, which in this case was using as much as possible, um, that appears to have had a negative impact on the um, damaged goods rate. So we would probably want an answer choice that ties the worker's action, using as much packing as possible, to the increased rate of damage. Do you see why that is? Because um, even though correlation does not necessarily mean that there's a causative thing in critical reasoning, in this particular case, that's the only thing that's changed between you know before and after when their damage rate is at X and then it goes up to Y. The only thing that's changed is they've gone from using perhaps less packing material to using as much as they possibly could. In a limited scenario like this, that makes that the likely culprit. Anyway. A, the change in packing policy led to an increase in expenditure on packing material and labor. Remember when I said how wrong answer choices are often uh, uh, done by time or money? The increase in expenditure, that's meant to attract your, your, your MBA minds out there. So, uh, But that's completely irrelevant. Cost is not part of the argument, therefore it cannot be part of the, um, the solution here. Choice B. When packing material is compressed too densely, it loses some of its capacity to absorb shock. So here is um, an instance of an answer choice that ties the use of a larger amount of packing material to um, the likelihood of things being damaged. So let's you know keep this guy and keep looking. A choice C, the amount of packing material used in a carton does not significantly influence the ease with which a customer can unpack the package. Well, who cares about customers unpacking the package? We're talking about damage in transit, damage on the way. So um, whether customers have difficulty getting it out of the box is not a factor for this question. Uh, choice D, most of the goods that TrueSave ships are electronic products that are highly vulnerable to being damaged in transit. So that's true before and after the consultant's recommendation was enacted. So um, this is not something that explains the change in why the consultant's uh, plan didn't work, why damaged goods actually increased somewhat uh, when they started adding more packing stuff. Um, that the goods are equifragile the whole time. So it's not D. Equifragile, not a real word. Anyway, choice E, TrueSave has lost some of its regular customers as a result of the high number of damaged items they received. Uh, sad, but um, again, irrelevant to the, the, the consultant's uh, recommendation. So choice B um, is a direct correlation between um, adding more packing material and a reason why more stuff might be damaged. The packing material, when it's compressed too densely, remember workers put in as much as they could, um, when it's packed too densely, it loses some of its capacity to absorb shock, and therefore the goods would be more likely to be damaged. Choice B. Still page 488. Question number 10. We might actually get through all 11 today. This is good. I guess we'll see. Cable television spokesperson, this is what they're saying, uh, subscriptions to cable television are a bargain in comparison to, quote, free television. Remember that free television is not really free. It is consumers in the end who pay the 
who pay for the costly advertising that supports free television. Um, which of the following, if true, is most damaging to the position of the cable television spokesperson? So um, the cable television person is saying that network TV, you know, non-cable TV, free TV, um, network TV isn't really free because it has commercials. So we need something that weakens that position. So A, consumers who do not own television sets are less likely to be influenced in their purchasing decisions by television advertising than are consumers who own television sets. Wow. Okay. Um, so the, the comparison is between free television and cable television. The right answer choice is going to hinge on people watching television um, no matter what. So people who don't own television sets uh, wow, I mean, that's staggeringly outside the scope of the passage, so that one should not have been tempting to you at all, hopefully. Uh, choice B, subscriptions to cable television include access to some public television channels which do not accept advertising. If anything, this strengthens the cable television person's argument that um, free television has advertising, network television has advertising, and cable TV you just pay for, you pay directly, you pay a subscription fee as opposed to paying via commercials. Um, so if cable also has access to public television stations, which are also commercial free, that if anything strengthens the argument. So it's not B. Choice C, for locations with poor television reception, cable television provides picture quality superior to that provided by free television. So true uh, as someone who grew up in a rural area, but also so outside the scope of the passage. Um, we're talking about cost. Network TV, the cost paid via commercials. Cable TV, the cost paid via subscription. So it's not uh, C. D, there is as much advertising on many cable television channels as there is on free television channels. So the cable spokesperson's argument was, hey, free television, you pay via commercials. Cable television, you pay via subscription. If it's true that there's as much advertising on many cable television channels as there is on free TV, then with cable television you are paying not only via the subscription, but you are also paying via commercials, which is what the spokesperson was saying was the cost of free television. So this absolutely undermines the uh, cable television spokesperson's argument. Let's just double check E though. Cable television subscribers can choose which channels they wish to receive. Well, uh, to some extent, you can actually do that with free TV too. You can, you, you know, you can just not watch certain channels. Just don't turn to channel six because you hate it or something. So, um, you yeah, this is again kind of irrelevant. So it's not E, leaving us with uh, if there's advertising also on uh, cable television, it totally undermines the spokesperson's argument. And I'm going to try to squeeze one more in so we can get through what we published we would do today. So page 488, question number 11. Wood smoke contains dangerous toxins that cause changes in human cells. Because wood smoke presents such a high health risk, legislation is needed to regulate the use of open air fires and wood burning stoves. Which of the following, if true, provides the most support for the argument above? What is that argument? To paraphrase, wood fires are a health risk and they are such a health risk that um, legislation is needed. So the correct answer choice will strengthen the idea that they are a health risk to the point that legislation is needed. Choice A, the amount of dangerous toxins contained in wood smoke is much less than the amount contained in an equal volume of automobile exhaust. So this says that wood smoke is less bad than um, uh, automobile exhaust and that's you know somewhat regulated already um, so if anything, it weakens the argument. Choice B, within the jurisdiction covered by the proposed legislation, most heating and cooking is done with oil or natural gas. If there isn't too much wood, wood fire, wood smoke going on, uh, perhaps it's not so much of a health risk. If most people are cooking with oil or gas, it's not that big a deal. That definitely does not strengthen the argument. Choice C, smoke produced by coal burning stoves is significantly more toxic than smoke from wood burning stoves. Again, the question is whether we should do something about wood smoke. Not just because something is worse out there doesn't mean we need to. Doesn't affect what we, whether we should act on wood smoke. So it's not C. 
Uh, D, no significant benefit on, uh, no, excuse me, no significant beneficial effect on air quality would result if open air fires were banned within the jurisdiction covered by the proposed legislation. So that definitely weakens the proposal. If it says there's not going to be any benefit, that's not strengthening <laughs> the argument. So that leaves us with choice E. In valleys where wood is used as the primary heating fuel, the concentration of smoke results in poor air quality. That's exactly the health risk sort of thing that we were hoping for in strengthening the wood smoke argument. So choice E is the correct one for number 11. I will stop there. Um, and so thanks for joining us for the beginning of the critical reasoning section. My name's Jim Jacobson. You've been watching Grocket.com, and this is the GMAT edition of OGTV, question by question, cover by cover, going through the 12th edition to the guide. See you next time.